Oh, oh fucking popcorn. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Corey LeBlanc. I also call myself the Ceremonial Witch. I don't know why I always start this shit off like this. Like I said before, I had a very small career in radio when I was a child. And I only got to say the weather and um, news. But still pretty cool. Too bad I fucked it up. Anyways. Hi. Um, battery low. Fuck you, battery low. This is not even sucking up the fucking thing. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to figure out where my uh, signal's coming from. And I think it's coming from my Bluetooth bitch. But anyways, I'm going to turn this bitch off. So today, what do I want to talk about? I don't fucking know. Um, it just up. is what it is, I guess. And um, I'm just going to do me. You guys can do you and listen. Now, Jordan Peterson. I talk about him a lot. I've tried to... I actually never really tried to stop talking about him. And, you know, I, I'm always a little leery. And I got to tell myself, stop fucking worrying about it, man. Hopefully the people that listen to you are about the message and not about the sight, the appearance, and the bullshit that people say. And, you know... I can't completely agree with my mind that tells me that. It tells me not to worry because obviously if I'm worried, it's because on some level I worry about what he's teaching. So what I mean by that is, you know, because he like before his biblical series, I was all into him. He does the biblical series and because I recently adopted the attitude that uh, the Bible's all bullshit and this and that. Uh, not, not recently, but let's say a year ago. And that's hypothetical. I don't know when it was, but a year ago, I adopted the belief that the Bible was full of shit. It was made to, you know, hold us back, man-made religion. And then recently, I've been going over how it's egregores in there, thought forms created, blah, 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 something like that. So when I, somebody I look up to that I think is wise and is not necessarily metaphysical, he does speak about ancient religions. He does speak about, um, and just to, in his defense too, for the religion thing, in his biblical series, multiple times he does say, I don't know why I feel the need to say this, but he has said multiple times that I'm not saying the Bible is was a tool for to oppress people, abuse people, and for other people to have power and enslave people. Something to that effect. As he says, I'm not saying that this is what the Bible was created for. He's like, but that has been done. It has been used. It has been used to kill people, slay people. He's like, I'm not disputing that either. I know that's there. He's like, however, I know these stories and I can't explain why, but these stories are somehow deeper than that. And once again, a lot of people like to say, well, this religion's older, this religion's older. And absolutely, I believe uh, probably a lot of the Bible is taken from other stories, other traditions. Um, the one thing I will say about the Bible is it seems to have multiple traditions all in one place in that book. Um, so that's the one thing I think that speaks to people a lot because there's a lot of old traditions that are no longer around and obviously their books got burnt and shit like that. But, you know, when something is legit, it stakes around like the Kabbalion, for example, like the, the book of Thoth, um, which is not even technically, it doesn't even have a, a live representation. It's not even written anywhere, but it's a theory, a theoretical and you can get insights and that's the book of thought basically uh alistair, alistair crowley wrote some uh book of thought and his version of it anyways point is emerald tablets was one but it's different it's discovered Kabbalion was thought to be a lot older than it was and turns out it was in uh, i think renaissance either a little bit before or a little bit after renaissance so people kind of dismissed it but it's still around meaning it's got weight to it bible obviously has a weight to it and you know Maybe it was taught in schools to keep it around and, you know, whatever. There could be a lot of bad things around it. But like I say about magic, magic's not good nor bad. The Bible, money, not good nor bad. Spirits, for that matter, could be, well, neither good nor bad. But depending on who uses it. So if you got some guy in the Vatican using it incorrectly, well, then, yeah, it's going to make the Bible look bad, you know. Point is, there's a lot of bad things said in that Bible. I know that. But there's more good things said in there. There could be mistranslations on purpose or by accident, whatever the case is. But this is one of the reasons I have always, always say, you know, I'm putting Jordan Pearson on here, blah, 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 blah. I always feel bad about playing him, but he's one of my favorite guys to listen to, especially because he's not talking about magic. He's literally aimed at fixing people's lives in ways that whether you believe in metaphysical stuff or you can't even believe in metaphysical stuff or you're suicidal or you're rich. Whatever the case is, whatever is making you happy or unhappy, you can kind of relate to him until he touches on something that, you know, you're programmed against or you don't like or maybe you're trans or whatever the case is. 
Luckily, and now I, I have nothing against anybody who is trans. Like I've said this before, homosexual. I think everybody should be allowed to do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. My man, Mr. Crow Crowley. Well, I think he said it himself. This is Alistair Crowley says. Uh, Crowley, uh, this paraphrasing, but Crowley because I'm holy. And my enemies call me Crowley because they want to disembowel me. No, that's not the word. But Crowley was a word he said that his enemies called him. And he called himself Crowley because he was holy. That was his own words in one of his books. I can't remember which one, but I read almost every single one of them. And once again, he ended up dying uh, addicted to opiates. And some people say a little insane. Who knows? We weren't there. He could be on an island somewhere. He could have already came back. He said he was going to reincarnate as a woman. There's a lot of women that claim to be him. And Madonna, according to... Oh, Robert Ant Anton Wilson says that uh, Madonna was the only one who didn't claim to be him, but would be most likely to be the one that would be like him. Doesn't matter. Anyways, why am I talking about that? Peterson, biblical series. Everybody should check that shit out. And I don't care if you're atheist. I don't care if you're a witch. I don't care if you're magic. I don't care if you're a ceremony magician. I don't care what you are. I don't care if you're Islam, Judaism, Christian. Doesn't matter, okay? His point in those things, to me, my interpretation isn't, and I used to think it was, but it isn't to get people to believe in the Bible again. It's to get people to believe in a higher power again. Now, he uses the biblical Bible because he probably has pressure from groups, Christians, whatever, whoever. I said, and I still stand by this, that Christianity is a book, is a religion for people if they don't know what or who to believe before they develop their own, their own religion. It's a religion that helps people find a reason to go have kids, go to work, pay their bills, and stay in line, not get in trouble, not do bad things. Likewise, the law is also there to enforce that. If people found out what the world really is, assuming it's anything that I pretended to be, which I got like 10 theories, and I stand by each one, and there's probably a top three that I really think are true, but I don't know which one of those are real, but I know somewhere within all three of those, and uh, as above, so below those, and within, without those, point is, I know there's the truth around something there, or I got a third of a third of a third of a third of a sixth of a sixth of an eighth of an eighth of a tenth of a millionth of what reality really is, but that's more than what other people are trying to put out there, and to me, what's real is real, and that's all that matters, but point is, if people knew what this reality really is, or at least had a piece of it, they might... Because you go through stages when you hit this shit. You have to. You're breaking programming. You remake programming. When you break programming, you go dark places. You wonder why. You have to go to work. You wonder why. You have to do anything. Feed yourself. Wash yourself. Anything at all. And I've done it. Every time I've did it, I had trouble believing in God. And whenever I stopped believing in God, I had dark times. Okay? And I think that's what happens regardless of your beliefs. If you're in witchcraft... You no longer believe in God and you're starting to believe in the gods or the planets or whatever the case is, but you haven't quite believed in them yet, but you just lost your programming from Christianity, let's say. You somehow got rid of it. You deprogrammed yourself. You're going to have a hard fucking time of it. You're bringing on your own dark night of the soul, which I say is a good thing, but it's a hard fucking thing. It's going to hurt. It's going to be brutal. You're going to wish you were dead. It's not as bad as opiate addiction, but it's somewhere close to it, okay? I'm telling you, it's not an easy fucking thing to go to. Yeah, opiate withdrawal can be... Um, hard on your body and it hurts and you're in pain but this is like a psychological pain that doesn't hurt your body you can do things but you don't want to do anything you know at least with the opiates you can't do anything because something is holding you back and take a pill and it's gone right but this is like well you can take a pill but it's not going to help you can do this it's not going to help nothing is going to help because your mind is has lost something and when that thing is we don't have somebody watching over us. We're not created. What is the reality of this? It's a fucking hard thing to go through. But anyways, um, that's what he's trying to teach. It's not necessarily about God or about religion, or about Christianity. But, you know, it's about believing in a God, period. And the reason he probably picked that book, and I don't know. I'm not him, and I don't think he's actually said it. Maybe he has, but the Bible is used everywhere. At least here in the West and in England and, you know, these places. And, you know, you go down to uh, Arabia or India, you might see the Quran more. And you go down lower than that, you know, Africa, wherever. You're going to also see the old, just the Old Testament and Kabbalahs and shit like that. Point is, though, 
you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and even Islam all comes from the Bible. Those are the three major tribes of the world. So, therefore, these Bibles are in our juries, in our judges, in our schools, or in our law systems, in our prisons, in our everywhere. They're everywhere. And if you don't understand the book that was, I said this before, and I think I got it from him. If you don't understand the book that our laws, the law uses, obviously they have their own book, the black book, the black Bible, the fucking, uh, what the fuck's it called? I can't even think of it. But the book that the judges and the lawyers use, okay, obviously that's their, that's their jargon, okay? They use the Bible to create their system, but they have their own jargon, so we don't know what the fuck they're talking about, so we have to pay high prices to get a lawyer, which is probably going to fade out soon enough. Besides the point, but if you don't understand this book and the stories in it and how things happen and you know, then you're fucked. So if you don't want to go and read the Bible or the Old Testament or whatever the case is, well, start with Peterson's lecture series. Start with his fucking Old Testament Genesis story, um, the Bible fucking interpretations because you might like like his opinion. Um, you're probably wrong about what you think you're going to hear, but you might be right too. And you know, depending on where you are in your programming, you might not even know. If he is disagreeing or agreeing with you, you know, you might think he's all about Christianity and you might not listen to him for that reason. And then maybe you go listen to him and you misconstrue everything he says that it is Christianity because you don't interpret him the way I interpret him. And I'm not going to say you don't interpret him right or wrong. I'm just going to say not the way I interpret him. But point is, um, you know, listen to it a few times if you want. But all I'm saying is you can listen to it and at least just learn the Bible stories itself. And you'll get a very small concept grasp of our history that is goes by the Bible, which may not be accurate or is accurate, but it's the one they teach. So therefore, it's the one your kids are going to know and people are going to continue to be taught. So if you want to learn how to fight against this stuff, if you want to learn how to disprove it, well, you first have to learn it. You can't just listen to the side of the, uh, the argument that you like and then try to disprove the other side without knowing their facts. Because you go against somebody like Peterson, who's probably neither for or against, but you start being against and throwing facts out there and he thinks you're just an ideologue which you probably are which just means you're you're possessed by an ideology ideology that's the thing i like about pearson he's not he is a practicing catholic i've heard him say it before but he's not possessed by it yet anyways and maybe this is maybe he's so intelligent it's a slow scheme to get there you know because the way he drops it it could be perceived as that i'm not gonna say it's not i don't know him personally but i don't think that's the case but it's going, to be, it's going to be beneficial to you. And I mean, if you listen to the questions at the end of the thing, I mean, I, I haven't counted, but, you know, either one third to half of the questions asked have to do with the series, which means that obviously by a uh, process of elimination, the other half does not have to do with what he had just talked about. Therefore, people are going there to ask them a certain question or they're going there just to watch them or whatever. Infer what you want from that. But what I'm saying is people like them so much, they're just going there to watch them. It's not even about the Bible. Now, that being said, if Peterson was to say, I'm going to make my own religion, I'm going to use the Bible for my religion, but it's not uh, Roman Catholic, it's not Catholic whatsoever, it's not Catholicism, it's not um, Christian, it's none of that. But I'm going to use these stories. I'm going to use this God maybe or whatever. And, you know, we're going to make up our own rules. So who wants to join? I'm going to be the leader. I guarantee you he would have enough people to have a small religion today. All over the fucking world. And thank God he hasn't done that. And that should be a reason alone to believe that he is somewhat depolarized. Somewhat not out to get power. And somewhat trying to help people. Because I'm telling you right now. The power and the following that man has. That he can drop something as polarizing as interpretations to Christianity, the Genesis stories, the Old Testament story, sorry, and to not lose half his following overnight. You can infer two things from that. Oh, everybody's Christian, I listen to him, which isn't the case if you listen to the questions, because I'm not, and I like the guy. I think he's awesome. And I know a few people that aren't Christian that love the guy too. And that's one of the reasons, because we can see through what people are trying to say about him. It's not it's clear cut. But anyways, but... The fact that he's not power struck of power, that he still puts up his money or, you know, I mean, he puts up his money, he rents these venues and then people come see him and he makes money. He makes the book. He's obviously making money. That's his point. But we all have to make money to survive. So people got to stop saying, well, the man's making money. just taking your money. That's bullshit. We need a job. You need a job because you're taking your boss's money. Does that mean you're corrupt? No. Your boss is paying you to perform a service. People are paying him to 
do a service and that's teach them. Anybody who doesn't understand that or thinks are jealous because they don't do it are going to say, well, he's a fraud. And there are frauds out there. Absolutely. The guys that were jealous and they said instead of fucking dissing it and just being sitting back and, you know, those who can't do teach, they went out there and fucking pretended to be the guru and made their fucking money. Who knows? Who cares? You're the idiot that bought off them personally. But sorry, I'm not talking to anybody. All I'm saying is the fact that he hasn't started his own religion or following or he's pushing his views on anybody. You know, he does it. He tries to interpret something and he takes the grounds and he tells you exactly what he's doing. So to me, that's the best you can do. Obviously, you're going to get his opinion. Obviously, it's coming from his nervous system. Obviously, it's coming from his beliefs. But you're going to get the best neutral knowledge about the Bible. But it's not neutral. It's biased. And it's his bias you're going to get. But still, like me... I don't know how to explain this. This is just one way to explain it, but I have the gift of spirits talking through me. Now that sounds fucking crazy and wackadoo, and you know, please don't send fucking uh, a short bus here with a fucking straight jacket. But when I said a few episodes ago that I can hear energy, this is what I mean. I can also feel energy, but not as much as I can hear it. I can't see it, but I can hear it. And what that means is I can hear energy to the point that I hear it and it comes out my mouth. Okay, if I want to. Now, people, not everybody can think inside their head. I'll play a clip from Peterson and a few others that say this, so you don't just think it's Peterson saying it. But people don't all think in their head. And more than that, even the people that can think in their head, they can work things out, but they still work things out better when they talk out loud or write. You know why? Well, depending on the person, it's because they can hear what they're saying and then it bounces off of them and then they're able to push something down. It's kind of like the particle I was talking about uh, the last episode with the slit experiment, how it splits, bounces off each other and decides where to go after that. Well, when someone writes something down, they have the idea in their head, they hear it in their head, right? They put it on paper and from there something new comes out because what they heard in their head isn't exactly what's going on the paper. Likewise, when you start talking out loud, what you're saying isn't exactly what you thought it was. More than that, you finish saying what you thought about and there's still more coming out of your goddamn mouth. And you're like, where the fuck is this all coming from? But you don't realize it till way after. Like, holy fuck, I'm really smart. No, wrong approach. Something's talking through you. Something important. There's people like this. I think this manifests in many different ways. It could be drawn. It could be seen and reinterpreted, which would kind of be the same as what I do. If something is in front of you talking to you somehow, you see something, you're going to hear it too probably. I don't really know. Maybe sign language. Maybe it has a sign. It writes it down. I don't know. Point is, psychic mediums, they might pretend to see something sometimes, but they might be just like me. Or they might actually see something in front of them, like I explained before. And the ones that smell stuff is also another inclination. All these things can be worked on and developed to the extent of where your chart is and all that shit, but you can make it better. You can go above what your chart tells you you are. Point is... I'm the type of person that you can point me in any fucking direction, any topic out lately. I used to think it was about the books I, I took in. And I think that's a part. But there's books I've never read before that I know stuff about that's in there. So, and, and it's even deeper than that, but I have a hard time explaining that. I'd have to point at something specific about that and then something will come up. But I'll, I'll prove that after. But what I'm saying is you're probably like this too. I don't think people that watch other people are too different from them. Like attracts like. What you need to learn and what you need to know is going to come from somebody who similarly has some kind of interest you have. doesn't mean you're going to be exactly alike. Me and Jordan Peterson, are, Jordan and Jordan Peterson aren't exactly alike. I wasn't necessarily an alcoholic, although I did drink a lot of alcohol, especially when I was doing cocaine, but also when I was doing opiates. But both had addictions. He was a smoker. I'm a smoker. Both had to quit. We both had a thirst for fucking knowledge that can't be quenched. There's more and more to learn every day and you just want to keep learning. So sometimes it's easier just to stop, teach what you're learning, and you learn by teaching more than just trying to learn, and then, you know, you're going to continue to evolve yourself. But point is, there's a lot of stuff I admire about Jordan Peterson, and that's why I'm drawn to him. Likewise, if people listen to me for whatever reason, something sparked in them, it's probably that internal voice that's talking through me right now that found the people I watch, like Fred or Xavier and Birch. There's a lot of things I relate to those guys within myself. Likewise, the people listening to me from all over the world, and I'll maybe say the cities and towns and countries later, but um, they probably have similar features to me. Now, some of them might 
talk like I do. Some of them might be earth signs. Some of them might be addicts or ex-addicts. Some of them might be smokers, whatever. But you might, the majority of you out there might be the type that think like I do, automatic way like I do, and hear energy. Therefore, if you want to develop this, start doing meditations, sit down concentrations, and the like. And I'll get more into that. Um, probably what this episode's going to be about, I guess, now. And then I didn't really have a name, but just started talking, and here it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am back now. Before I get into Peterson and why the Bible series is super important and why I think Peterson is even more better than someone like me, not that I think I'm trivial or not good at this because I do think I have a talent for (coughs) point me in a way. The more I think about it, the more I practice it, the better I get. And it's not to say that I, I should, I'm somebody that should be making lots of money or I'm somebody that should be taken seriously. I'm not trying to say that at all. I just happen to feel and know that this is uh, this is something that I don't know what it is. I can't really explain, but I know it's powerful. I know it's real. I know it's I know it's something that it can't be um, it should not be dismissed, let's say. And I think Peterson is even more so better. Um, obviously than me at the moment because, you know, experience, right? He's dealt with people. So he's got the real live, um, he's got the real live studies to back up his shit. Whereas I only have his information to tell you without actually having seen what has happened. So, for example, when he says, you know, to get someone to get rid of their fear... Uh, the arachnophobia or whatever the case is because of my memory I can remember everything he says word for word and tell you it and I can pull on that correspondence now for the rest of my life I always have that but uh, but and I mean it's it's probably it's a true fact right the things I know if most of them are true facts then that makes me you know worthy that makes me not worthy but that makes me a reputable a reputable I guess source because all the things I know are factual therefore and the way I put it together you know people might want to listen to that let's just say but I don't have the first hand experience like he does I wasn't there in that room when he was uh, diagnosing that person who uh, he got that information from therefore um, that's why he's better than that was one of the reasons why people should listen to him like I said regardless of if you think the Christian stuff and the Bible stuff is good or bad, it really doesn't matter. Um, because those stories are, are our, our archetypal stories and our archetypal stories happen in our life. They play out. It's what our movies are. I've said it before. In our day and age, you don't have to read the Bible to get the stories of the Bible. All you have to fucking do really is... All you really have to do is fucking watch movies. I mean, you know, if you knew the structure of the Bible, if you had some kind of layout that said, okay, these are the archetypal stor- stories of the Bible, then from there you could pick your movies and start watching movies that way, and then you would know the stories of the Bible more or less. Because I'm telling you right now, every Bible of the story has been made into a movie at some point or another, consciously or unconsciously. It has no relevance or meaning whether it was done on purpose or by accident. But point is... Everything we've seen, watched, did, the ones that had the most profound effect on us, they're all from Bible stories, maybe even earlier than that, Mesopotamian stories, and even more before that. You know what I mean? It's just, it's over and over and over again, these things happen. But before that, I just want to say that, you know, if someone wants to get in touch with their knowledge side, they want to start getting this information to come to them where... They don't even need to necessarily read books anymore, which you should still keep because it tells your mind that you're not just going to be arrogant and know you have all the answers, although that is the case. But Frater Xavier put it well, and I don't think I've ever grasped it until now, but he said, see, I'm not some Yoda, 
um, Zen, like Yoda, um, He said he's not some uh, Yoda Zen-like monk um, thinking of all these philosophical Buddhists. Not really Buddhists, but all these, um, you know, higher power way. I forget how he worded it exactly, but his point was he's not some, you know, guy who is uh, sitting around thinking of all these ways to make videos and shit like that. He doesn't need to because he knows this. And what he knows is if he's quiet his mind, he uses meditation information will come to him when he looks at something for this is how it works for him but when he looks at something he gets a flood of information and you know that is one of the secrets That is, in my opinion, one of the secrets of life that we are meant to learn in this lifetime. Um, point blank period to me that is that is an absolute fucking truth that is one of the things we are meant to learn and are supposed to know in this lifetime now so and oh, sorry it's like 8 a.m um i've been up for like an hour or so so i'm a little tired i haven't had coffee yet oh no i have pre-workout it hasn't kicked in yet i guess but point is um um I don't think that's secrets for everybody to know. Like I said before about my trainer in my last episode for the first date, he had a really good well life. He was uh, well off. And sometimes if you're ignorant and you have money, you're better off to be ignorant to have that money than to be awakened and have money. Because if you're awakened and you have money, well, it may not necessarily be a good fucking thing, you know? Um, it might actually be a bad thing because then you won't – you'll be – torn between giving it all away or, you know, um, enjoying it or, I don't know, for his, and that guy was awesome, he taught me a lot, uh, one of the things I meant to mention in my last episode, just on a quick sidebar, when he said there are more dangerous things in Canada than um, coronavirus, now, he didn't go into the depth saying that, but it wasn't long after that that he asked us, I forget the name of the second spider, it was like this brown looking spider, big enough to but the first one was a black widow. And he said, a black widow and the second spider, are are they um, native to Canada? And everybody said, no. He's like, no, they're not. Are they in Canada? We all said, as far as we know, no, unless someone has one as a pet or whatever. He said, okay, yeah, some people can have them as pets. He's like, but they are crawling around in certain places in Canada. We're like, what? He said, oh, yeah. He's like, and like the coronavirus, if you have a weak immune system, if you're younger or really old, on the, on the extremes of that spectrum, not in the middle where your your system should be strongest, then there's a good chance you're not going to make it. Now, if you get bit by one of these, there's a good chance you're going to need the venom. Not everybody does. Some people can just fight it off. It'll go through the system and it'll be done with it. It depends on how strong of a person you are. It depends how strong your immune system is. But um, there's a good chance you can beat it. And that's what he said about people. And... You know, I thought that was probably one of the things he was referring to. But the fact that we have spiders that we don't know where they are could be in our house. And, you know, we get bit by spiders every night. Well, that's a pretty bigger danger than the coronavirus. So everybody out there worried about this fucking cough they're getting, especially if you're getting mild weather like I am right now. Like, it's mild as fuck right now. What happens is when it's mild, will all the viruses that were dead by the cold come back to life because they're like insects. Viruses are very small versions, just like insects. They never die. They freeze when it gets cold, but they never die. So, but anyways, that's just a little sidebar. But um, I got to go inside and get my daughter ready for school, but you're not going to notice. All right, I got to go to my son's school there, or stepson's school in a second to uh, talk to the principal. Nothing bad actually happened, though, so that's pretty cool. But um, before I do, I just wanted to just, I said venom, and I meant the antidote. Now, we don't 
for some reason, the first aid trainer told me that, that we don't carry the antidote. We don't have it lying around because it's very seldom they need it when they come across this. Um, and one of the things that I found fascinating about it was um, when you get when you get bit by this uh, the black widow, it actually leaves a bullseye. And I don't know if you remember, but I said in one of my episodes, and if you have children or come across ticks, live in Canada or anywhere else near a bush where you might have ticks, well, they also leave a bullseye when they bite you. So that's quite fascinating. Um, but what I meant by it was the antidote. We don't hold the antidote here in Canada. Um, it has to be flown in. Um, if you have a strong immune system, you will make it by the time it gets here. Um, and if you don't, then you won't. And some people have had it and didn't even know it, thought it was maybe a tick, tried to get it out of themselves, went to the doctor, found out it was that. He said, by the time the shit gets here, it won't matter. You've already would have beaten it. Um, but, you know, you're still going to have some hell as the venom goes through your system and shit like that. So, you know, nothing to be completely scared of. Um, and, you know... You may not believe what I just said, but coming from the first aid trainer, someone who's training people in first aid from the Red Cross, I think it's a little more legit than the shit that might be seen on the internet. A lot of people like to make wild claims, or they might be think might be spreading what they think is true, and then it turns out not to be true. But regardless, um, back to what I think is one of the things we need to learn in this life. The Wayfarer Xavier, like I said earlier, I think I think I explained this earlier. He said. It comes to him. He doesn't need to sit around thinking about philosopher, philosophical things because he has the cross communication to his mind. Therefore, like I said, when I point and aim at something, I get information. In the Jordan Peterson thing, in the Cain and Abel episode, okay? If you're going to watch any of them, I think everyone up to the Cain and Abel one is par excellence. From the questions at the end to all the things he infers, I think the first three, okay? The third one, he touches on the creation stories. And he actually says the second creation story is older than the first creation story. Now, believe what you want about that. I don't know. I don't think so. But once again, I mean, we're, he's going by information and I read the information and I see that information, but fuck, it doesn't make sense in my head. But other than that... um, you know, that's just my personal opinion, but I've been wrong many times and I'm not afraid to, uh, I'm not afraid to fucking admit when I'm wrong and I'll gladly admit when I'm wrong. But point I'm trying to say is, um, fuck, what was I trying to say? Oh yeah, the first four or five, five, first three creation, then it's Adam and Eve and then it's Cain and Abel. So yeah, I think it's five, but the first four prior to that, he barely talks about the Bible stuff. Adam and Eve is the first one where he talks about the most of the stuff and he gives you some great info on that and some of it's so metaphysical, some of it's so magical about words and creation with words and about egregores and entities because he goes into detail on how nothing exists until you name it. And to me, this is just like the whole thought form thing I talk about. And he literally talks about that. It's like when you go downstairs or wherever your kids are, it's like, what's going on here? And until you know what's going on, you can't do anything. You can't punish your children you can't tell them what to do you can't teach them a lesson you can't grapple with whatever chaos is there but once you find out okay we were fighting well you know take this for what it is but it's like okay well there's something going on between these two boys there's something at a mental level that is making them fight with each other either one is jealous of the other one they're Cain and Abel you know one might kill the other one (laughs) but point is they're fighting with each other right now they're fighting with each other right now. They're grappling. Something bad's happening. So once you know fighting, it's like, okay, evil spirit here, getting them at each other, making them aggressive. Maybe Mars has kind of got a hold of them. Maybe it's a Tuesday. Who knows? But you can say, okay, they're fighting. Okay, separate them. You know what to do once you name it because you know what thought form is there. You know what entity is there. You know what they're doing. You know their mindset. You know what's going on. But if they both lie to you and say, oh, sorry, we were just playing a game. We kicked something over. And then you go back upstairs and then it happens again after you told them not to. And you go down the next time and someone's bleeding and say, okay, you fucking lied to me. What's going on? But point is, the first one, he barely touched. He doesn't touch anything. The second one, I think he says a few lines and then that's it. Weirdly enough, the first Genesis, the Genesis creation stories happen in chapter two of the Bible, but that's a video for another time. But I think in the third one, he hits a few more lines. Um, the third one might be Adam and Eve, actually. And then the fourth one is Cain and Abel. But point is, they're so loaded with info. But 
Peterson, like I said earlier, is somebody like Freder Xavier, like Birch. Anybody like Birch who does a Q&A just lets people come and ask them questions. Means they are so confident in their information that they can do and answer whatever the fuck they want. Like It's because they have that cross-communication. Because they're confident enough to do that, right? Um, Birch is a great example of that. Now he's got... His core information, as he calls it, with all the stuff he knows, but he also has this correspondence thing down where if you ask him a question, he can answer it, you can compare it to something else, and get people to understand what he's talking about. He also knows what he's doing, he's been doing it for years, you know. Um, Pearson to Birch to Freighter, Xavier from Mind and Magic Channel, they all have this capability. I believe I have the same capability, not at the same level of these guys, you know. Birch. And Peterson are apples and oranges are what they talk about, but I think they're very close in their ability to do that. That's why, you know, um, uh, Peterson will go on stage, do a whole fucking lecture, and then ask questions. He's that confident that he can answer about this because he says if you're going to lock in front of people, you need to know more about than just one thing because people go up there talking about their own topic. When someone branches off or compares to something, they're fucked. But when someone knows more about everything, their, inf- their informational is secular, then they can, they can go up there confidently. But to me, maybe it is a secular thing. Maybe people are designed like that. They have so much information in their head, they can answer anything. Or I think it's more like we're conduits and energies talk through us. They go for specific people. And, you know, maybe you do have to read so many books to get there because... Otherwise, there's no reason for people to take your word for it. If you just start going out there and saying, hey, my prophet spirit's talking through me. And that's what I think mediums do from time to time and why people disregard them um, is because they go out there and they claim that some supernatural entity is talking through them rather than going out there and say, hey, I'm a psychologist. I took care of people for 20 years from people that were forced to come talk to me like addicts to people that were um, to addicts to people that were um, – Lawyers of high power law firms that were working too much and everybody in the middle with phobias and fears and eatable moms and all this. And I've read Freud and I did, took me 13 years to write my first book and I've been doing this, you know what I mean? So that gives him credentials, you know, but deep at heart, he's probably just a psychic medium and anything he talks about, he can tear apart and anything he looks at, he's getting information. He's hearing information. It's not so much seeing like a psychic medium perhaps. And maybe that's why the psychic medium might be better off just and I don't, I don't want to live in a place where someone can't say, hey, I see spirits and they're talking to me and everybody laughs at them and makes them down. So don't get that impression from me. I'm just saying because of the way I'm built, being more agreeable and not wanting to people to laugh at me and shit like that. If I was seeing energy and that was giving me my information, whatever way that happens, I'd probably fake it and come out here and saying, hey, I manifest stuff, which I have. And I read all these books, which I have. So... When I start talking about stuff, people can infer that, okay, well, maybe he is doing this automatic uh, podcasting, this automatic recording thing that is very similar to automatic writing. But, you know, it's probably all coming from the subconscious mind from the books you read. And that's easier for people to swallow than when I say spirits are talking through me. Because I don't know spirits are talking through me, but more and more, that seems more evident. And then I watch these things by Peterson, who doesn't even really believe in magic per se, but yet... He does believe in metaphysical things that happen. He does know there's power in mosquito, uh, and mosquito ma- mushrooms. He does know that our mind is something we don't understand. He will tell you that for a fucking star in the sky, for it to be out that night when you see it, that couldn't be there if your eye wasn't there for that photon to go to your eye. And you say, how the fuck does that be? Well, you got to go look at Char- Charles, not Leland. Um, but anyways, in the, in the number three with uh, Adam and Eve one, he ex- goes into depth on... How he doesn't, he can't explain that to you because he's not a physicist. However, he read the physicists that make that claim and tell you that, you know, the whole old thing that if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, the answer to that is no. It makes a sound to whatever's there to hear it. But if there's nothing there to hear it, it does not emit a sound. And you can say, well, there's obviously a sound made. Yes, but if no one hears it, then there's no fucking sound. It's simple as that. So if you don't want, if you think you can't be hypnotized, well, if you would. If you were willing to let someone try, you'd be fucking hypnotized. But if you are not willing to be hypnotized, and because you're not willing to be hypnotized, you'll never go see a hypno- hypnosis, then you'll never be hypnotized. Does that not? But does that mean that the TV hasn't hypnotized you before? Absolutely, it has. It does it all the time. But you're too arrogant to understand that. Same kind of concept, okay? But 
I increasingly more and more think that that is what's going on because there's things I've never read about that I know answers to. And then when I'm done, and that's another thing I want to point out, there's a lot of things I explain and say um, that people might infer that I have done. And I'm, I'm going to, I'll be honest here, and this is brutally honest, and hopefully no one thinks that I'm fake or fraud, but and it's not just to... It's not just me telling you what I think people need to do, but sometimes that is the case. There's things I know I should do that I don't do, so I say it out here out loud, and I might infer that I'm doing it, but that's not always the case, okay? You ever curious about something about that and be like, well, this guy says he does this, or he never really said he did this, I'm going to ask him, go for it, and I'll be honest with you, I'll tell you exactly the things that, you know, if you bring them up that I can remember, because I'm not going to be able to just tell you all the things that I've said you should do that I haven't done yet. That being said, especially when it comes to magic or ritual, whenever these ideas come out of my mouth, if I've never tried it before, I fucking try it that night or the next night. You know, if I fell asleep by accident this night, well, then it's the next night I try it. Point is, when these random things come out of my mouth that I don't know anything about and I don't know where they come from, it's fucking awesome because then I get more information and I go use it. So this is where I'm basing this information off of. But I'm telling you, yeah, that's something you're going to get from Peterson uh, within the first four Bible lectures like i said the first two you're not going to hear much about christianity and all that and i mean it's old testament it's more judaism it's more kabbalah to be honest it's cain and abel my god they're sacrificing things and it's not people it's like plants well maybe there's animals there i'm not really positive but the pictures speak for themselves you know what i mean they're burning things on altars you know i think cain gets so mad that god doesn't like his fucking his uh doesn't like his fucking sacrifices he's offering him. But Abel, everything Abel does is just fucking gold to God. And he's like, well, what the fuck, God? Why are you, why are you so fucking biased? Why do you hate me so bad? He's like, it's not that, but it's you. You fucking suck. You're making up your own hell. And it's like, okay, if this entity walked in your house, and this is paraphrasing, mad, like crazy, but if, let's say this, and it's more sexual reference in the Bible, or that's how it's been interpreted. But to me, how Pearson says it, this is how I got it. It was like this evil entity that comes into your house. You invited it in. Together, you made an aberration, a bad thing. You fucked. You made a bad baby. It was fucking everything up. You created, to me, I take this as an entity, as a thought form, by the way. But I take everything as a thought form. People know that by now. But there's this thought form around you, telling you things to do, things in your ears. You're accepting those thoughts. And then when you accept those fates, and those fates play out, and your life is shit. You're fucking blaming me. I didn't make you accept those thoughts. I didn't tell you to allow that shit in. If you would have banished that shit before it came into your house, then this shit never would have happened. But you didn't have the discipline to do that. And you think giving me shitty sacrifices is going to fix that. And I don't even care. Your shitty sacrifices are shitty. But I appreciate you trying. But that's not the problem. You have power in your speech, bruh. And if you're going to use it wrong, bruh, you're going to get fucked, bruh. No, sorry about all that. I don't know why I do shit like that. But the point is, the way he explains it is like, you let this evil entity into your house and together you guys made a baby and that baby is evil. So that's what I mean. I take that as a thought form. He didn't banish it. He accepted it. He brought it in. And then he's blaming God for what he did. He had the free will to do. Now, I'm not Christian in any way. I don't think this is a true story, but I think that's a fucking crazy metaphor for what everybody does. They create, they accept negative thoughts all day long and then complain their life is shit. And it's like, man, stop accepting that bullshit. Accept what you want. Say out loud what you fucking want. And if you want to say you accept that, do that over and over again until it fucking happens. Add some fucking love and gratitude for that emotion and it'll be done, man. It's as simple as that. And if you don't believe me, quiet your fucking mind. Learn how to meditate. Ask the question. You'll get an answer either through a dream or somewhere else and you'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe he's right. But I'm telling you, that's the secret. That's, that's the secret I was trying to tell, get to. Is if you want this knowledge, you want this cross communication, you want to be able to talk about whatever the fuck you want and sound smart and impress people and whatever the case is, start practicing a meditation. It doesn't matter which one. You get good at any of them. Put on the, the Qigong meditation that I play, okay? Follow along. Make your mind do exactly what he says. And you don't know how to do that, send me a message. I'll tell you how I do it if you really need the help. No problems. No questions asked. I won't even judge. I don't care. I want to help. But because he talks about moving your key, but you're supposed to be doing it in your head and all that. And just picture whatever you want. In all honesty, that's what I do. 
I pick which way it's turning. And whatever color, if there's a manifestation I want, you know, if I'm trying to get money now, I'll do it green. If I'm just trying to get the right emotions to play out of me because I'm having a hard time emotionally, then it's going to be a blue. And then, you know, if I need protection or, you know, maybe I'm a little angry, it's going to be fucking red, you know? And then if I want thoughts, if I'm trying to get more wise, more wisdom, then it's going to be yellow. That's what I go with when the color and then going left or right. The only time I put my hands physically on myself is when I put my left hand and my right hand on top of it on my navel for that meditation. Maybe I'll, I'll hit the link up in here in the description. I haven't did any links in a long time, so I'm very sorry. But I mean, you guys are smart. You can find the shit I'm talking about. You got the names and the people. But anyways, um, if you do that meditation long enough, you're going you're gonna to start getting this cross-communication. And from there, you can do what you want. I mean, you can make sigils to ask for this information without even doing meditation. I think that would work, but it's not going to work as good as if you can quiet your mind. And... Practice working at one thing at a time. Likewise, I really think you got to give up the TV or at least reduce it as well. I'm not saying you can't watch TV because I watch YouTube like I'm watching TV. But I'm always learning about something and it's one thing going on at a time. Not simultaneously pictures go all going on at once. You know, cars driving by, people driving by, two people talking at the same time. Continuously changing what's going on. You know what I mean? That's hard for your mind to grasp and it thinks it's real. Well, the things I want my mind to know what's real is the magical shit. Not the fucking fake world of Grey's Anatomy shit, you know what I mean, so, anyways, but, so helpful, so beneficial, and listen to it, I got so much more, so much more things to say about fucking uh, Pierce and his show, because, like, I listened to these four first ones today, and last night, and, I mean, the wealth of information that surrounds it is just coming to me like crazy and the one thing I like I thought about just now with the Cain and Abel story is after Cain kills his brother God knows it banishes him out and Avenged Sevenfold is one of my favorite bands never knew what the name came from even though I have to write in the bio and all that and I know was, I know he's a reborn again Christian the lead singer or maybe the whole band whatever but if anybody kills Cain after Cain killed his brother he's going to have Avenged upon him and his family seven times because meaning if that person kills Cain for what Cain did for killing Abel because everybody liked Abel Abel was a good fucking guy and you can say well where does everybody come from well it's a fucking story man get over it, it doesn't it's not real you can say well Adam and Eve is real they're the first people they make Cain and Abel and it's, well, where does the wives come from where does this come from where did that come from well you can say that the Adam and Eve story happened all over the world you can say the Mesopotamian story was before Adam and Eve, therefore, those people are kicking around somewhere. You can say this, you can say that, it doesn't matter. But to me, it's a fucking story, man. So, let it be. Um, maybe God was creating other people because you realize, like, oh, fuck, I fucked up on Adam and Eve. Okay, next two to go in the garden. And then the same thing just kept playing out. Snake kept fucking people over. Or, you know, that was God's plan to get people into consciousness. Likewise, I don't think it's an accident the good guy that everybody likes doesn't become king. And even worse, he gets killed. I think that's on purpose. And it's a fucking strong argument for, well, why would Christianity, why would Judaism keep this in the Bible and not attribute it to the devil? Why would they say the devil possessed Cain and made him do that? Why wouldn't they say something like that? And it's like, well, there's wisdom in that. Do you want a king that knows what it like, it's like to kill up another person and from there never kills again? Or do you want a king who never does that, that everybody likes, and that people will eventually get jealous and want to overthrow him and kill him like his own fucking brother did? Which one are you going to want? Which one of those two is more likely to get taken over? And likewise, the kingdom gets fucked over. And which one of those two are going to be likewise a stronger one who's going to think about, well, maybe an army is needed, maybe some weapons are needed. It was Tubal Cain, one of Cain's descendants, obviously a few generations down the line, who was apparently attributed to making weapons. Point is, the Mesopotamian story saying humans are made out of the blood of the worst king demon that um, Timat, um, the asteroid belt, basically, planet, water planet. Um, that one, um, that was, um, sorry, my wife just texting me, I was reading the text. Um, that's what we were made out of the blood of. So to me, 
I can't tell you if that story is actually first astrologically, chronologically, um, narratively, whatever you want to call it. It's fucking figured out of the fucking, uh, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, fictionally and non-fictionally. But to me, the story of the planets in the Mesopotamia, this is very similar to that. It's like the parents, you know, the mom and dad is the son and... Uh, how would I put that? Anyways, to me, it's the same thing. It's, you know, you can say it's the one that killed Time at, And then that guy, you know, he's the one that creates, that's our God, apparently, that creates us out of the blood of demons. Well, why would our our first king, be one of the descendants, because you can say we all came from Adam and Eve, and I'm like, oh, sure, that, that's logical, because they were the first parents, but Adam and Eve came from the parents, so... We every the further the farther we, we get away from Adam and Eve and and Cain and Abel, the less divinity we have within us. And I think it's appropriate that the we all come from a murdering son of a bitch who murdered his own his own. Um, and like I said, this, this shit's not real, but it's a story to show you that you can be Abel, you can be Cain, or you can be both. And odds are we are both. We have both Cain and Abel in us. Some people are more able, some people are more Cain. But that's yin yang, baby. That's that's everything. That's your subconscious mind and your conscious mind. That that's absolutely every fucking buddy. I was just at my clinic, my methadone clinic, and a friend of mine, him and his girlfriend used to do a lot of speed and then they started uh doing needles of coke and I think they're onto heroin and putting uh pills up there and one of the rules of my clinic is if your eyes are closing and shit like that, it's like on the nod pretty bad. Um, you know, they have to take awareness. They got to take measures, ask them what you're taking. Almost treat you like you're going to have an overdose, basically. And it was a girl doing that. And then the boyfriend was in and out of the back. He had big garbage bags. God knows what. But um, it made me think of what uh, Peterson talks about, Sleeping Beauty. So when a woman is all her subconscious mind and not a conscious mind, um, she is going to go into that sleep forever. Women are more prone to depression, anxiety, and stuff like that, to be depressed, to want to sleep the days away, you know, whereas men are more prone to committing suicide, going in on the crime path, and just, you know, thinking not giving a fuck about life anymore. That's the differences. Well, I see the guy going out and performing crimes to either get his fix or to self-destruct, basically, and I see his woman wanting to use to the point where she can't feel anything, where her eyes are closed. And that's what it reminds me of. She's sleeping beauty. She's without her conscious mind because her partner isn't fulfilling her. He's without his partner. So he's, you know, they're both fucking only half a person because they don't have the other side of their mind connected or have a relationship. And, I mean, if you have both of those things, you are going to be on top of the world as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, this whole twin flame thing first starts within yourself. Now, I'm not saying you can't find the love of your life before you connect your mind together. That's not it at all. You might already have it. You might already have it right now. It doesn't matter. What I'm saying is when you have both, it's better. But people normally have one or the other. You know, the monks and stuff like that and whatever, they have their mind connected. And boy, are they powerful. But I don't know if they have to look to a female being above them because they're still in this realm it's still a material realm to sit around just being spiritual all day it's all great and fun but it's not what we're here what we were put here for likewise not being spiritual at all is not any better i mean you need that connection but the point i guess i'm trying to get at is if you first connect your minds or you first have your other twin flame you're going to get things things are going to happen two minds are better than one but you start not communicating well, and you get in the magic, you connect your mind, well then, you're back on the right path, and from there, it's probably going to find a way for you to fix what was going on, if it's not too late, and, you know, everything will be good. But you need to do both. You need to find your twin flame, you need to attach your two minds. So if right now you don't have a partner, maybe you don't even want a partner, well, work on attaching your two minds. If your two minds are already attached, then work on looking for a partner that you could do that with. You don't have to marry them. Fucking don't even want to date them if you don't have to. They could be a best friend. I'm not completely convinced that a twin flame has to be a partner. I think it might have to do with the opposite sex or at least the opposite polarity of yourself, but 
once again, this is uncharted territory. We've got all this information about twin flames that are, you know, biased because they're in relationships with somebody they think they're the twin flame. They're explaining the relationship, but if you were to ask the other person, they might be unhappy or whatever. And I'm not saying that's the case for everybody, but I'm just saying it's it's a hard thing to talk about. But, yeah, I don't know how much more I'm going to go into today. I've got a lot of info, but I kind of want to just put out a small episode um, just to see what people think. And then I might play the King and Abel fucking shit after this just so you get a taste. But I think his, his earlier ones are really good for the introduction to it because... Uh, because you see what's going on, you hear what's going on, you hear what he's going to talk about, and you hear the different ways he interprets this shit. But anyways, um, yeah, if I don't come back on, I uh, hope you have a great fucking day, like always, and, you know, uh, enjoy. All right, so right now I'm actually live. First time in a long time I come on here live. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to play... Um, the Cain and Abel story is like a fucking two and a half hour one. Um, I think they're all about two and a half hours, all his biblical series. Um, I was going to play the key on after this so you guys can meditate, but I think I'll just put the link up for that. Anybody wants me to play the key on one I use again, because I'm pretty sure it's in a past episode, but for some reason you can't find it. Send me a message, leave a comment on this, send me a fucking message via on YouTube with this video or any other um, one it'll go right to my email or send me an email or on instagram whatever you want to do find my shit somewhere and send me something um you know, if you're on itunes or somewhere else where you don't know this information well cory dot blah blah one 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 that's four ones in a row okay eleven eleven basically um you can say what the fuck is that for well you know my birthday was the 11th and who knows but anyways um that's my email, and, you know, Spreaker. You know, Spreaker.com, you put Ceremonial Witchcraft, you'll find it. Same for YouTube, Ceremonial Witchcraft, or Corey LeBlanc should bring up my shit, or even this title name. Anyways, but yeah, so if you want me to do something like that, you want me to talk about something specific, you want to argue with me a point, I don't care, send me something. Um, Send me a recording if you want. Fucking, you got an iPhone, you got just a recorder, send me a fucking audio file. I'll fucking transfer it to whatever I need to do if it's not the right format. And I will not not play it. I don't care if you're threatening me. I don't care. Whatever the case is, I will. Now, be warned, if you're threatening me, I'm going to play it and probably make you look like an idiot with, you know, the spirits and all that. But I'll do my best to remain grounded. But what I'm trying to say is if you want to fight me on any of these points, whether it's from Jordan Peterson is a Christian pushing the Christian doctrine to... The Bible is all just bullshit to anything else I've ever talked about. The spirits, the channeling, the um, the the meditations, the everything, anything. You want to argue with me? You want to talk to me? You want to ask me questions? I'll play you live on the air if you don't want that. And I can blank out your name. I can space that out. I could hit the mute when you say your name, whatever the case is. So no problem. Just leave that. Um, and even if you are dissing me, if you're fucking yelling at me and calling me a fucking idiot, and you want to remain anonymous, I make you a promise right now. And... You know, you'll know, because if I play it and I play your name, well, then you can turn around and say, he said he promised he wouldn't, and he played my name the fucking prick. Well, I, then then you'll have this as, as reference to reference back to, but I'll even blank out your name if you're insulting me. There's no worries, man. I don't. I won't judge. I get it. Uh, I'll understand whatever stage you're at by whatever you say to me, and I'll also understand what kind of person you are, your makeup by that. So it doesn't matter. And uh, like I said, I want to help. I don't want to just help the people that want help. I want to help the people that don't want help, but... Peterson and others have said it. Be very weary of helping somebody who doesn't want help. Um, or sorry, I think he said, don't help anybody who doesn't want help. And be weary, be very cautious whenever you're helping somebody who says they want help. But likewise, you can't help anybody until they say they want help. Like someone who wants to quit drugs can't quit until they're ready to actually quit. Like smoking wise, I, I enjoy smoking, believe it or not. With all the bad shit I know about it, I still enjoy it. And, you know, everybody in my house is coughing. You know, due to all these viruses coming out of the ground, probably, and whatever else. And, you know, who knows? But I'm the only one not coughing, and I'm the only smoker. So go figure, you know? Like I said before, my blood work came out perfect at my job. Um, I know what to do. I'm not saying you can main... I can't... I'm not saying I can maintain smoking my entire life. That's just silly to say. And I'm not saying everybody should take up smoking. It's going to heal you from coronavirus or something stupid like that. Not what I'm saying at all. But... You know, there are ways to protect yourself from this stuff. And like I said, first line of defense, reject, banish, deny. But anyways, back to this. 
I'm gonna play. I'm gonna start at a hundred and hundred and five. Uh, one hour and five minutes into the Genesis for the uh, Cain and Abel story, and you know, I have to work for two thirty right now. It's twelve forty two according to my phone. So I'm gonna be here listening to this until I have to go, basically. And you know, if I can weigh in on a few parts, pause it, and talk about a few things, I will. However, I mean, that, that's something I've always wanted to do, but I kept myself away from that. I'd rather talk about, play the clip first and then talk about it after, or talk about it first and play it after, and then your mind can infer the rest. So me pointing it out to you. You hear what I have to say, then you hear it on there, and it's like, oh, and things click in the way you need to interpret it from your own mind. This way I'm not just... Because your mind was going to develop something around that idea, right? And then all of a sudden, I pause it, I tell you my opinion. And you might say, oh, my opinion was stupid because he thought about this. And so I don't, I don't want to discourage someone's own thinking. I want them to, you know, take my ideas and alter them so it works for them. Or, you know, banish, deny, reject, deny the ones that don't work for them and accept the ones they do like. So, you know, I might just point out a few things. There's the first human being, Cain. Like, oh, shit. Like, I might point out a few things like where he says specific things. This is what I was talking about. I might go into depth depending on, you know, the spirits. But, yeah, so that's what's going to happen. So if you don't hear from me again, well, I'll probably just ride this bitch out. So it is a shorter episode than usual because it's about an hour so far. This will be another hour and a half. So it's going to end up being a long episode. I can't make a short episode if I tried. Anyways, yeah, so, yeah, enjoy told you that the Mesopotamians thought that mankind was made out of the blood of the worst demon that the great goddess of chaos could imagine. Well, the first human being is a murderer, and not only a murderer, a murderer of his own brother. And so, you know, Old Testament, that's a hell of a harsh book. And you might think, well, maybe that's a little bit too much to bear. And then you might think, yeah, and maybe it's true, too. So that's something to think about. I mean... I, human beings, you know, like, they're amazing creatures. And to think about us as a plague on the planet is its own kind of bloody catastrophe. Malevolent, low, quasi-genocidal metaphor. But that doesn't mean that we're not without our problems. And the fact that this book that sets, sits at the cornerstone of our culture would present the first man as a murderer of his brother is something that should really set you back on your heels. And again, she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. There you see a very old representation. There's Abel there, and he's got his sheep up on the altar, and Cain is bringing a sheaf of wheat, and I don't know exactly what's happening here with the blood but, or it's a ray, perhaps, or something like that. But the overall impression of the image is that something transcendent is communicating with this sacrifice. And you see, that's a, you think, oh, how primitive, you know, how primitive these people were sacrificing to their God. It's like, you know, those people weren't stupid. And this is not primitive. Whatever it is, it's not primitive. It's sophisticated beyond belief because. The idea, as I already pointed out, is that you could sacrifice something of value and that that would have transcendent utility. And that is by no means an unsophisticated idea. In fact, it might be the great idea that human beings ever came up with. It's an answer to the problem that's put forward in the story of Adam and Eve, right? Because we became self-conscious and then we discovered the future and then we knew... What the hell are you going to do about it? Well, sacrifice. That's the hypothesis. 
quasi-genocidal metaphor. Cain is bringing a sheaf of wheat, and I don't know exactly what's happening here. With the blood. Sorry, I but, fucked up everybody. I or it's a ray, perhaps, died, or something like that. My bad. The overall impression of the image is that something transcendent is communicating with this sacrifice. You see, that's a, you think, oh, how primitive, you know, how primitive these people were sacrificing to their God. It's like, you know, those people weren't stupid. And this is not primitive. Whatever it is, it's not primitive. It's sophisticated beyond belief because the idea, as I already pointed out, is that you could sacrifice something of value and that that would have transcendent utility. And that is by no means an unsophisticated idea. In fact, it might be the great idea that human beings ever came up with. It's an answer to the problem that's put forward in the story of Adam and Eve, right? Because we became self-conscious and then we discovered the future and then we knew we were going to die and then we knew we were vulnerable and then we became ashamed and then we developed the knowledge of good and evil and then we got thrown out of paradise. It's like, that's a big problem. So what the hell are you going to do about it? Well, sacrifice. That's the hypothesis. Well, that's a hell of a hypothesis, man. That's what we're doing. You made plenty of sacrifices even to sit in this theater and many people made plenty of sacrifices to have a theater like this exist. And many people made sacrifices so that we could actually freely engage in the dialogue that we're engaging in in a theater like this. And so it's like all oh, this is built on sacrifice and sacrifice bloody well better work because we do not have a better idea. Sacrifice, what's the counter position? Murder and theft. So let's go with sacrifice, shall we? And perhaps we won't consider it so damn primitive no, because it's not so primitive. And again, she bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, okay, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, some people have read into this the eternal battle between herdsmen and agriculturalists, which raged in the American West, for example, because the herdsmen liked to have their herds, sheep, cattle go wherever they were going to go. And of course, the agriculturists, the farmers, like to have things fenced off. And so, and the agriculturalists actually won in the final analysis. But anyways, Abel is a keeper of sheep. And that's interesting because that makes him a shepherd. And I think that's part of the critical issue here because a shepherd, I talked a little bit about shepherds before. You know, if you look at Michelangelo's statue of, da of David, which is another staggering work. I mean, not David, he's no trivial figure, and of course it's David who slays Goliath, right? And Goliath is like the giant of the patriarchal enemy, it's something like that. And, you know, Middle Eastern shepherds, they had to keep, take care of sheep, and they're edible, and the lambs are very vulnerable, and there were lots of wild animals around. It wasn't like England in the 16th century, it was like there were lions, you know, and you had a slingshot or a stick or some damn thing, and so your job was to keep the sheep organized and not let them be eaten by the lions alone. And so you had to have a clue and be tough and self-reliant and all of those things. You had to be tough and self-reliant. You had to be, be able to take care of a lot of vulnerable things. You had to be able to do it on your own. And so that's all built into the shepherd metaphor, and it's you know, it's a tough thing. for. It's not a great metaphor for modern people because we tend to think of the shepherd as someone like little Lord Fauntleroy, you know, like some little, little certainly not a lion-killing, hyper-masculine, lion-killing, you know, monster. That's not a shepherd. The shepherd sort of dances around and, you know, it's not, that's not the metaphor here. That's, that's, that's not the metaphor here. So Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Okay, so he's participating in this sacrifice. Had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now, you don't know why that is, and this is a built-in ambiguity, I think. Now, I think there's textual hints, but I'm not sure. Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, he brought... High, it's a high quality sacrifice. You don't know that Abel's sacrifice is low quality because it doesn't say, you know, Abel brought God some wilted lettuce and then burnt it. He doesn't say that. 
but but there isn't a sentence there that talks about how high quality Cain sacrifice is. But in any case, the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. So there's a hint that Abel's putting a little bit more into the whole sacrificial thing than than Cain. But there's also a hint that maybe God is just like liking you a little better than he's liking him. And that's, I think, useful from a literary perspective because there is that arbitrariness about life. You know, with my own children, for example, one of them has had, I would say, he things come easy to him. He's lucky, fortunate, however you want to put it. He, he seems to be that sort of person. Whereas my other child is like, it's just like one horrible Job-like catastrophe after another. And it's so strange to see that because as far as I can tell, there's the characterological differences are certainly not accounting for the, for the, for the difference in destiny. You know, my one, the one child who's had so much trouble, I mean, as a child, was just a wonderful child. So... And yeah, he's crying here a little bit because he's talking about his little girl. Amazingly happy and easy to get along with and fun. And they have a terrible time of it. And it tears me so, up. So, who knows what God's up to. It tears me up every time I hear it. But distributing fate equally certainly isn't one of them. And just imagine having a little girl have to go through a bunch of hell. And you're the father of that, and you're studying psychology, and you're trying to keep your faith. And man, that would shake my faith. I'm telling you that right now, which might be why he says he's a Catholic and a Christian, but he's not completely, uh, you know, he's not just a dogmatic fuck face. <laughs> I guess that's what they put it. But his daughters went through a lot, and you know, so maybe people get their tests in life just at different times. Maybe God can't test everybody at the same time. And some people need their test first, and other people need their test later on in life. Maybe that's figured out by a different power. I like to think that because we have a hierarchy of gods, in my estimation, though, the planets and stuff that we can see are the ones that kind of take care of around more than, no, the creator of everything. Creator of everything is not going to be the one in charge of just our realm. The reason we make hierarchies within business, within friendships, Within our households, with our children, with everything we do, we make a hierarchy, a rank order, where somebody's more in charge, somebody gets more responsibility, because it's something to strive for. It is not so much uh, people want to abuse their power. However, that happens. Sometimes hierarchies are just for power and shit like that, but not, I don't think it's the majority, but that's an opinion that I have a hard time with also because I, I, I see both sides of it almost equally on different views, and it's just it's so hard to make up your mind about that. But the one thing I always come back to is as much evidence as there is out there for hierarchical hi, hierarchical structures being, you know, the shittiest fucking thing that's happened to women and other races such as, you know, African Americans and whatever else. And God, there's so much bad things that have happened to just Indians on the reserve here in my hometown. But when I go outside, I don't see that. I see people trying to help people. I see people trying to survive. I see people doing nice acts. I see the odd asshole being a dick just to be a dick. I see kids trying to run out in front of cars and flipping us off and shit like that, being kids. But that's far from evil malevolence. It's not what we read about in our history, you know? And uh, we're so far from that that it's it's hard. That, to me, whenever you hear and read something and see how shitty the world is on the internet and then you go outside and none of that's present, to me tells you, you know, that's only 50% or less of the world that makes up that malevolence. Or there's only 10% of it, but it gets so heightened because it's so bad. And people need to know that this these things are possible. Is the perspective I like to take nowadays just because... It's a little more nicer. And instead of thinking there's malevolence everywhere and the the media is trying to point that out to us, so we live in fear, which is probably true, but I'd rather, if I have to see something like that, if I'm around people and I have to pretend, you know, I watch news or just sit there and watch it because wherever I am, that doesn't really matter. But when those times come 
and I can't just say, well, I don't watch TV, I don't watch the news, and I don't like watching the news because it's always fucking uh, negative, and, you know, I think they're doing it on purpose. Instead of saying that, I like to believe anyways that, you know, the little bit of bad things that happen in the world, because there's bad things that happen everywhere, but it's a smaller percentage than the amount of good. We don't report on the amount of good. We only report on the bad, so it's a continuous reminder that we have this capability to be bad. Don't let it get this fucking far. Stop fucking up. Get your life in order. Something to that effect, anyways. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, angry. Wroth is a tough word. And when these are translated many times, it's hard to get the full flavor of the words. But wroth and his countenance fell. Well, to have your countenance fell, this is sort of up. To fall is to, to have it be heavy, depressed, for sure, angry, for sure, resentful, probably, wrath, that's anger. So Cain is not a happy clam that his hard work is being rejected by God. Now that's worth thinking about, really, because you think about how human that story is, you know. You're out there, well, we could say... You might be a useless character and, you know, you're whining about how catastrophic your life is and it's pretty much obvious to everyone around you and you that it's your fault. You just don't try. You don't wake up in the morning. You don't get a job. You don't engage in things. You're cynical and you're bitter and you're angry and you don't try to help the people near you and you, you don't try to fix up your own life and you don't take care of yourself and, you know, and then things go wrong. It's like, well, really... What do you expect? But then, but that's, that, I mean, that doesn't mean someone in that situation will just say, well, that's okay, I deserve it, and they'll be happy about it. They won't. They'll be absolutely bitter about it and angry. But, you know, put that aside for a moment. There are people who seem to struggle very forthrightly, let's say, and still have one catastrophe after another happen to them. And so, it's, there's no easy answer in this, in this story. It's like, you can... Fall, fall a foul of a God because your sacrifices are second rate or you can just fall a foul of God and you don't know why well tough luck for you and then what happens in either case is exactly this almost inevitably Cain was rocked and his countenance fell well you know you meet and I people like this write to me all the time I've seen so many many of them as clients you know they say they're 20, not so often, 30 more commonly, sometimes 40, their lives haven't gone well, you know, they're in a pit of despair of one form or another, and not only are they in a pit of despair, but they're extraordinarily angry about it, and God only knows what they would do with that anger if they had the opportunity to give it full voice, right, you know, one of the things I've always thought about Hitler is that, you know, people, you have to admire Hitler, that's the thing. Because he was an organizational genius. You know, the thing that doesn't stop people from being Hitler, the thing, people don't, people don't refuse the ambition to become Hitler because they don't have the genocidal motivation. They don't follow that pathway because they don't have the organizational genius. They've got the damn motivation. And, you know, if you take a hundred people randomly and you talk to them and you really talk to them, you'll find that 5% of them would take their vengeful thoughts pretty damn far if they were just given the opportunity. And, in fact, they do because they make life miserable for themselves and often for their family and sometimes for anybody they can come near. And then maybe another 20% of people have that bubble up in them on a pretty damn regular basis. So, you know, you can have some sympathy for Cain. If you don't have any sympathy for Cain, then you're not. See, Cain and Abel also, they don't just represent two archetypal types of being. They represent, so it's not like you're Cain and you're Abel and you're Cain and you're Abel. It's like you're half and half and you're half and half and you're half and half. It's something like this. This is two different potential patterns of destiny. And you, you don't manifest one purely and the other zero. It's like, you're, it's, it's like the line between good and evil that runs down the human heart. It's exactly the same idea. And maybe you're more like Cain or maybe you're more like Abel, but there's still a little Cain in you no matter how able you are. 
and maybe more than a little, and probably more than a litter, little. And if you watch your fantasies, which I would very much recommend, you'll find that they show you dark things about you that will shock you if you allow yourself to be conscious of what you're thinking. So, it's a good time when you're having an argument with someone, especially someone that you love, to just watch the pictures that flash in the back of your mind. That's part of, let's say, coming into contact with what Carl Jung called the shadow. And the shadow is the manifestation of Cain. That's a perfect way of thinking about it. And one of the things that Jung said about the shadow, because Jung was not someone you mess around with lightly, he said the human shadow has roots that reach all the way to hell. And Jung meant that. That's no metaphor for him. Now, he might not have meant it in the same way that a fundamentalist Christian from, from the southern U.S. might mean it. But I would say that Jung meant it in a way that's far more terrifying and also far more true. So, and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. So there's Abel burning his offering away there. And he's in this sort of relationship with, let's call him the archetypal figure of culture, the archetypal father. And it's something he respects. That's the thing. It's an indication. That the posture is an indication of respect. And then there's Cain in the background. You see his face is in shadow and he's, he's jealous of what's happening here. And he's going through the motions perhaps. And maybe God just doesn't like him. We don't know. But he's going through the motions and he's not very happy about it. And that picture right there he's talking about is the picture I put on for the episode. I can only put one on obviously. Um, unless I put a bunch side by side but that fucking picture is pretty small. Depending on the app and where it goes and my settings for whichever app, which I haven't all done. So, anyways, but if you're wondering what he's talking about right now, because you can't see all the pictures he talks about, but this one, you can. <laughs> and you know, that that's actually a phrase that you could, you could carve into many people's tombstones as an epitaph for their life, which would be, went through the motions but wasn't very happy about it. This is really an interesting one, I think. I mean, so, I don't know what God's doing here exactly, but he's helping ignite the sacrificial flame. And that's kind of an interesting idea, I think, because, I tried to put this you know, let's say that you have big. an impulse to make a sacrifice. They're both on the same altar. Well, I should change this Cain's about my life. Well, it's like, where does that come from, that impulse? Whereas it's just, Abel's well, just it manifests anything. itself God's out of like nothing. For him so, well, or you came up with it. Well, you might want to stop thinking about that, thinking so surely that you come up with your own thoughts. You don't come... Oh, that's one of my favorite lines in this whole thing. This part right here, what he just said. You might not want to think that you're coming up with your own thoughts. Think about what I've been talking about recently. Like I said, this is why I don't want to do episodes like this, because I don't want to tell you exactly what to think. And that's what I was doing when I do this. So just pay attention to this next part, and then I'll probably stop it after this. All right. Fuck. I'm from that impulse. It's just, well, just it manifests itself out of nothing. So, well, or you came up with it. Well, you might want to stop thinking about that, thinking so surely that you come up with your own thoughts. You don't come up with your damn dreams, do you? They just happen. And God only knows where they come from. They come from your brain. Oh boy, that's a sophisticated answer. They come from your unconscious. Well, that's not much better. At least it's somewhat better. But there are those ma amazing dramas take place in the theater of your imagination at night. You don't even understand what they are. And yet they occur night after night. And those things, dreams, they can contain wisdom. That It just, well, it just staggers the person who has the dream once they get the key to the dream, once they remember it. It's like, oh, look, you just revealed a bunch of wisdom to yourself that you didn't know. Well, where'd that come from? Well, you don't know. How in the world can you dream up things that you don't know? That's a tough one. Maybe we'll talk about that at some point in this lecture series because there are some reasonable things that can be said about that. But, you know, the idea that 
there's something that's not you. Jung would call it the self. Carl Jung would call it the self, which he thought of as the totality of your being across time and space, something like that. And that, you know, each second that you exist is a slice of the self manifesting itself across time and space. And he thought of the, the self as partly the voice of conscience, whatever that is, that helps guide you when you have to make a difficult decision. And, and a difficult decision might be, well, what do I need to sacrifice? What is, how do I need to discipline myself, right? What do I need to forego? Well, how do you figure those things out? Well, you know, this picture is trying to put forth the idea that perhaps if you had established the proper relationship with God the Father, and we've talked about what that might mean, then he would help figure out how to get the sacrificial fires burning so that you could stay in a proper relationship with him across time. Well, is that such an unreasonable proposition? What's the alternative proposition? Well, this isn't working out very well, that's for sure. You know, Kate seems to be doing it I don't know what it is. It's like, he, it's as if he thinks he can only do it himself or maybe he wants only to take credit for it or something like that. He's not in this grateful, let's say, and inquiring, grateful and inquiring posture because that's what a prayerful posture should be. It should be grateful and inquiring and grateful is, thank God things aren't worse for me than they are. Absolutely. You should be grateful about that because they could be a lot worse than they are, man. Absolutely. They can be so bad. And inquiring would be, well, I don't really know how I could make it better, but I'm I'm open to suggestions, man. If I can figure out how to do it, I'll try it. That's the in, that's the humility and the inquiry. That's a humble inquiry. How? And that's what I meant by ask for what you want out loud. And if what you want is I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. Or what am I doing wrong? Might be what you want. You might want some answers is what I'm trying to uh, allude to there. And kind of gave that away, but I'm pretty sure you figured that out anyways. So, you know, I want a million dollars. Yeah, you're not going to get that shit, right? But you can get what you need. If what you think you need is money, you can ask for money. But ask for money for the right fucking reasons. Don't ask for 300000 so you can pay all your debts off and then not work anymore and I'm not saying that that's not possible but if you don't have the means to get 300,000 then buying a lottery ticket and getting it it could happen I'm not saying it won't happen but like I said in my last episode your transformation has to happen at some point and if you're going to get money before your transformation is complete then that money is going to be part of your transformation meaning you're going to lose the fucking money and then you might lose your life out of depression or you might lose some friends, or you might lose some family, or all of the above. You might gain an addiction. You might gain problems, and you don't want those. So if you want the big money to come to you faster, or whatever you want, it could be the same thing for a lover. If you're lonely and you want someone to be with, but you've been with countless amount of people, or nobody, but you want somebody, well, there's something that has to happen first, because right now you're too hard-headed, or your standards are too high, or there's something stopping you. And the only way you're going to get there is if you figure that out first and then it will come. The magic works regardless of that. But the point of the self-transformation part of the magic is if you do magic before your self-transformation, then the magic is going to work towards your transformation. Now, one of the other secrets, and it goes in line with the secret I said earlier, where is... If you want this channeling ability, you know, you got to quiet your mind. But all the answers to life are inside your body. We don't need a God. We don't need to go to a church. We don't need a priest. And we don't even need the fucking Bible to find out the story. But it helps unlock things in our mind to figure out our own body, our anatomy, everything. Epiphany Lectures likes to use the Bible for anatomy and it fucking works perfectly. But it's not the only level you can use the Bible at. But all the answers you need are within your body. And I know people say that a lot. I know that's like a party line for New Age fucking truth movement. But it doesn't make it any less true. And it's so fucking difficult. But all the answers you need is within your body. Talking to your cells is the answer. They know what to do. They know how to operate. They're going to go live and die with or without your consciousness doing anything to them. But if you can gain control over that, then 
you're going to have a more productive, successful, happy life because once you gain control of talking to your cells, you can do everything from healing to money to lovers because you're talking to all cells when you talk to your cells. But quieting your mind is the first and foremost best thing you can do besides reject, banish, deny. And the only reason I say besides is just because you can live, some people can live a life without re- reject, banish, deny and have a good life. And the other half need to... Um, Ah, sorry. Sorry, I meant that the opposite way. Uh, but I guess it, as both imply, some people could live a good life without meditating at all, and others, you know, they would need that. But reject, banish, deny seems like there's a bigger percentage of people that need to do it versus the other way around. Because even people that perceive to have more than you and are happy are probably miserable. So, because they might have money, but they might not have family. They might have family and no money. And, you know, they're always missing some aspects. And Reject, Banish, Deny will get there for them faster. But, you know, meditation is no small thing. I think, I, I don't know which one to put above the other one. I think they go together. So, point is, though, the other secret is your energies inside your body. Those planets, as above, so below. That fucking shit is so real. And yet... You can't see it, but you have to believe in that because that's the believing in yourself as a God figure. And you don't have to believe you're the God or the only God or you are a God, but you need to believe that a God made you in his image. And it doesn't matter if you think that image is the seven planets or it's the one from the Bible or whatever, but whatever made us, made us with an image in mind. And normally we make things as close to what we think they should look like, okay? So it doesn't mean our creator looks like us, but he made us a specific way, in a very intelligent way, whatever it was that made us. And you can say it might be all by accident, but I have a hard time believing that. But the point is, if you want answers, the answers are within your body. You have this soul, this spirit that you can fucking talk to and ask questions to, and you're going to get answers from. You also have other things that you can tap into that you may not know if that's your soul or not. So you got to be careful with this. And the more you quiet your mind, the best, the better you're going to get that. And when you get answers that you don't think are real, you just reject them. It doesn't matter if they were the right one or the wrong one. You reject them. It'll come back up again. And when you have a better understanding, then you can make another decision. But all everything you need, all the secrets to life, everything, what you want, what you need, it's within you. All you got to do is ask. I mean, this can be proven pretty simply because you know, and Peterson says, Peterson says this often, you know what you're doing that is wrong. And, you know, if you ask yourself seriously what you could do to make your life better, you already have the answer before I even finish that sentence. But if you want to pretend like you don't know that answer, well, that's your own fault. But once you get to a certain point that, okay, you know what you need to do, but you can't get there because you don't have the funds or the money or something like that. And this is an excuse to ignore the other stuff because you can pretend like you don't have a problem with X amount of things, you know what I mean? And then just try to do this next step. But you need to do the small steps first, like cleaning your fucking room, like standing up straight, like not lying, fucking telling the truth, making yourself the best person you can be so that you're worthy to get those big manifestations. Because I'm telling you right now, keep asking for the big money without the transformation part. You're going to get it, but it's going to fuck you up and you're not going to keep it. And it's not going to be worth it. So I'm not trying to sound like a fucking teacher or disciplinarian, but I just really think that that's something people need to grasp. The transformation part has to happen regardless, just like the magic has to happen regardless. Both of them are going to happen. You start on this path and you start trying to get things into your life. It might be a slow start, but eventually you're going to get there where they're happening. And if you forgot or, tr- or avoided transforming yourself, then those things are going to be your demise. Things better. It's something like that. And that's like, what sacrifices do I need to make in order to make things better? That's a good question to ask yourself. You could ask yourself that every morning. What sacrifice do I have to make to make things better? You can decide what constitutes better. How about that? Then it's not even as if it's being imposed on you. Come up with your own notion of what constitutes better. You know, try to make it sophisticated. It should just be better for you because that isn't going to work very well, right? You're, you're just going to fall downstairs if you do that because you have to live with other people. And besides, it's stupid anyways. What are you going to do? Like, you can't even, there's nothing you can even say about that. It's so... That, that's, the, that's the attitude of a very badly behaved, hyper-aggressive two-year-old. And I mean that technically. And so you could, you could ask yourself, well, how I have this day that lays itself out in front of me. 
What thing could I let go of that's impeding my progress that if I let go of would make my life better, my family's life better, my culture's life better, my being better? And then that would give you something to do for the day, wouldn't it? And to justify your miserable life. Because you need that. That's the whole point of the first story of Adam and Eve. What do you have? A miserable life. Okay. <laughs> what am I going to do about that? Well, if you just have a miserable life, you're just going to suffer stupidly and get bitter about it. That's what happens to Cain. It's like, well, how about not doing that? Because that seems to just take a bad deal and make it worse. How about making a sacrifice and seeing if you can please God and put being on track? God, that'd be something to do. What could be better than that? What could possibly be better than that? Well, that's why it's archetypal, man, because nothing's better than that. That's where it tops out. So, and you can do that. You can do that every day. You have to do it in a little way because, like, well, what good are you, you know? You're not going to go and bring this socialist utopia into being in one fell swoop. You might also think that, you know, one of the things Cain might figure out here, there's a couple of things that just aren't going right for him. Downwind of the fire, not the right place to blow from. <laughs> and the fact that he's in, enveloped in haze and smoke and breathing it in and the fire isn't burning might be an indication that he's doing something wrong. Or he could be wiping his eyes and saying, Jesus, what kind of stupid bloody universe would produce smoke like this? It's like, yes, well, that's the more likely outcome. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. Now that's an interesting line, because and I've looked at a variety of different translations of this, this seventh verse here, like a bunch of them, because... The translation for that, that's a critical line, and the translation really matters. And so I'll tell you what I think the story is, what I've been able to figure out. And I'm sure I haven't got it completely right, but it's... So he asks, the, the God says to him, if you do well, won't you be accepted? Well, there's a hint there, right? It's something like, well, things aren't going so well for you. So the first thing you might think is, you're not doing well. Well, does that mean you're not doing good? Does that not mean you're not acting properly? It means it's the hint. Because God is suggesting that if you were doing properly, you would be successful. I had a friend at one point who was a very bitter person. And he had a bunch of problems. And some of them were self-inflicted and some of them were fate, I suppose. And he had... His, he had become very, very destructive, murderously destructive, genocidally destructive, I would say. You could see it in his dreams. And, and he lived with me for a while. And uh, I knew him very well. He was a friend of mine from the time I was 12 until the time he committed suicide when he was about 40. And uh, when he lived with me, I was trying to help him get on his feet, which was why he had come to live with me, because he thought maybe I could help him get on his feet. And he could only take relatively low-level jobs, you know, like he had some mechanical ability. He didn't, he didn't get educated, although he's a very, very smart person. He probably had an IQ of about 135 or something like that. He was very smart. And so he was bitter, too, because he hadn't educated himself to the level that his, edu you know, his intellect would have demanded. So he had to take jobs that were beneath him intellectually. And he had, a he had that real intellectual arrogance, you know, because he was smart. And really smart people often come to believe that only smart matters, and if they're smart and all, that, and all that matters is smart and then the world isn't sort of laying itself at their feet, then they've been terribly betrayed. And, and then they cling to their intelligence, which is more like a talent or a gift, like it's, a, like it's an idol, you know, a false idol, which is exactly what it is and a very dangerous one, and get cynical about the stupidity of the world and the fact that their talents weren't properly recognized. And that's just not that helpful, you know, because smart is a good thing. But I'll tell you, if you don't use it properly, it will devour you, just like all arbitrarily assigned talents, right? So you might have a talent, but it's your friend if you 
use it properly and if you misuse it, it will be your enemy. And maybe that's how God keeps the cosmic scales adjusted. But anyhow, my friend was a very smart person, although not as smart as he thought he was, unfortunately. And, and, but he hadn't done what would have been necessary with that intelligence to make it manifest itself properly in the world. And that also embittered him because he also knew that there was more that he could have done if he would have done it and perhaps more that he could still do. What I was suggesting to him while he was living with us, because he was, you know, two levels from homeless by that point, was that he should find a job that he could find, working in a, in a garage, working in a shop, something like that, because he had some mechanical ability, and that he should, div, div, he should separate himself from the arrogance that made him presume that such a job would be beneath him. Because... At that point, no job was beneath him. And, but more importantly, it's not so obvious that jobs are beneath people. You know, because even if you're a... Even if, imagine you have a job as a, a checkout person in a, in a grocery store. You know, it's a fairly unskilled job. You can be a, some miserable, resentful, horrid bastard doing that job, boy. You know, you can come in there just exuding resentment and bitterness and making mistakes and making sure that every customer that passes by you has a slightly worse day than they need to, right? And, and you know, pilfering time and perhaps pilfering goods and being resentful about the people who, who gave you the position because they're above you in the dominance hierarchy and talking, you know, bad things, gossiping behind the back of your co-workers. It's like you can take your menial position, self-described, and turn that into a very nice little slice of hell. That's for sure. And, you know, you go into places like that. I always think of the archetypal diner in that way. You know, you guys have been in this diner. There's a really good opposite diner, and there's a great video on YouTube. It's Tom Waits reading, reading a poem by Bukowski, and I think it's called Nirvana. And it's about a good diner that, that he happened to visit, Bukowski happened to visit when he was on a bus when he was a, when he was a kid. A diner where everything was going well. and You could listen to that. It's great. I think it's great. But this is the opposite diner I'm thinking about. So you go into a diner, right? It's 7 o'clock in the morning and you order some bacon and eggs and some toast. And, and then you look around in the diner and you think, it was like 1975 when the windows were last washed. And there's this kind of thick coating of who gives a damn grease on the, on the walls, you know. And, and This is probably one of the funniest things I've ever heard from Peterson. And it's a great metaphor for hell on a plate, basically. The floor, too, has got that sort of stickiness that you really have to work at to develop over years. You know, and the waitress is, she's not happy to be there. And the guy behind the counter isn't happy that that happens to be the waitress that he's working with. And then, you know, you walk down the stairs maybe to the washroom and that's its own little trip. And so <laughs> you come back and you order your damn eggs and you order your toast and you order your bacon and then... It comes and, like, the eggs are too cooked on the bottom, so they're kind of brown. And then they're kind of raw on top. And, and they're cold in the middle, which is, you really have to work to cook an egg like that. Man. But you can master that with, like, 10 years of bitterness. You teach you how to cook an egg like that. And then the toast. Here's what you do with the toast, right? You, put the, you, take, you, you take the white bread, you know, the pre-sliced stuff that no one should ever eat. And then... You put that in the toaster, and you overcook it, and then you wait, and then you pop it out of the toaster, and then because it's overcooked, you scrape it off, <laughs> and you knock off the crumbs so it doesn't look too burnt, and then you wait till it's cold, and then you put cold margarine on it, because if you put cold margarine, first of all, not butter, but if you put cold margarine on it, you can also kind of tear holes in it, so that then it has lumps of margarine in it, and it's really dry, except where it's too greasy, so that's like its own little work of art, man, and then you put that on the side with the, with the, with the eggs, and then you have the potatoes, and this is how you cook the potatoes properly, <laughs> yeah, you know, so the leftover potatoes, and you keep dumping new leftover potatoes into the old leftover potatoes over weeks. And so some of the potatoes have, they're no longer potatoes, right? <laughs> They've half returned to Mother Earth. <laughs> then you flop them on the grill and you sort of, I don't know, you burn them a bit, I guess. And then you slap them on the plate and, Jesus, you don't want to eat those, man. <laughs> 
that's for sure. And that's the point. And then you have the bacon, and you want to make sure you buy the lowest possible quality bacon. That, that's, that's how you start. And then you throw it on the grill, and you don't, your grill has to be overheated to do this. You have to cook the bacon so that it's raw in places and burnt in other places. And it has that delightful pig-like odor that only really cheap, badly cooked bacon can provide. Or maybe you use those little breakfast sausages that no one in their bloody right mind would let within 15 feet of anything living, you know. And then you serve that, right? And you serve it with the kind of orange juice that is only orange in color. <laughs> and, and with coffee that's... ah. Uh, what would you say? It was started too early in the morning. That's the first thing. P bad quality coffee started too early in the morning. R got cold once or twice and has been reheated. And then you serve that with whitener. <laughs> it's like, here is your breakfast. It's like, no, man, that's not breakfast. That's hell. <laughs> You know, and, and you created it. And then what you do, if you have a diner like that, is because you have a miserable yeah, life it. if you have a diner like that. Burn and you've really it. worked on achieving that is every night you go home and you curse your wife and you curse your kids and you fucking well curse God too for <laughs> producing a universe where a diner like yours is allowed to exist. And he almost never says fuck. Almost never. So he was really pushing that point. I know you hear me laughing a lot. I love that part. And all this is just to show that it tells you the stories, but then he gives you real life simulations of what the stories mean. So he's not so much pushing Christianity or telling you to go to church or the priests or any of that shit. All he's doing is trying to tell everybody that these are archetypal stories that the people who put them together in the Bible... No matter what is said about the Bible, they did a pretty good job organizing them, putting them together, editing, whatever. Maybe, and I'm not for that line so much because I don't like the lines that were put in there about witches and witchcraft, magic and all that, pharmacia and drugs. And, you know, there's so many bad things, rape and pillage and all that. But once again, maybe there is a certain level you get to where you can understand those. But I'm nowhere close to understanding that shit. But... That could have been put there intentionally by other people for, for that purpose exactly, to create a duality where people are going to love the Bible, but I'm going to have a hard time with that. And people are going to hate the Bible because of those lines. Be like, how can you believe in something that has those lines in it? doesn't matter if the rest is good. Those lines fuck it all up. And maybe that's the point, is to show that within good, there's always a little bit of bad. Within bad, there's always a little bit of good. And maybe that's just there to throw people off. And only the people that can accept it are the people that aren't going to go to church. Aren't going to have a crucifix on their wall. Maybe not even baptize their kids. Which I did. I, I'm guilty of that. I baptized my kids. Because I want to create that belief in God in them so that they have it. So when it's time to trade it in for the real God and not the Christian God. Or whatever God they want to believe in. They at least have the preconceived notion that a God exists. And I think that's better than no God. Because no God, like I said, is a harder world to be in than one with a God. Just like for a kid, when they believe in Santa Claus, it's a better world. And when you get rid of that, it's fucking hard for a few years. And everything that happens to them after that is twice as worse as it would have been if they were still in that magical world where Santa Claus existed. This is the, the death of God. This happens to people all the time when they lose their God. They lose themselves. Because maybe they are gods and what they're losing is a part of themselves. I don't know. But you can get this from Peterson. But you have to go past the bullshit. And I'm not for Christianity. And I'm pretty sure I made that clear in all my videos. I'm not watching this because I'm a Christian. And I think it's I'm getting me closer to God. I think it's good knowledge from a man who clearly has whatever you want to think. It is spirits, higher knowledge flowing through him. With all the knowledge that he has attained throughout the years. It's flowing through a person who's got knowledge. And on top of that, these spirits are flowing through him. And then we are getting that knowledge. It's a good thing. It's the reason there's so much resistance against him. Not everything he says is great. Not everything he says is probably right. But I think whenever you can get into things like that, 
Because that's not really his story he just told. That came from somewhere else because he very seldomly tells stories like that. And that's why this is probably one of the best ones in the series because he did this a few times making jokes. And once he made the first one before this one, it started rolling and kind of happening. Point is, there's more than Peterson here. It's He's the conduit. He's the channel. But that doesn't mean, well, he doesn't matter. We're trying to listen to spirits. And if that's how you have to listen to him, then great. But there's a reason he was chosen for the spirits to come through him. And I'm not saying that to live myself because I say that. I don't know if that's what I'm doing or not, okay? I, I tend to think so, but I don't want to pretend I'm above or I'm special or anything. I'm just saying there's a reason he has been chosen to do this and that's why they're coming through them. So I don't care if you respect the man. I don't care if you believe in what he believes in. I'm just saying when you're stuck the next time you don't know what to watch since you're watching something right now that's great don't stop it watch this but when you don't know what to watch put on the first one you know and then maybe you'll find something else to watch for another few months and then okay next time put on the second one you know and then go on and watch something else for another few months and put on the third one and i'm telling you you're gonna get something from it because this is probably the fourth time i watch this shit and i get something new every single time that's your bloody life so well, so that's what God's trying to point out here is. <laughs> if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. <laughs> and if thou doest not well, then sin lies at your door. Well, so I, I looked at lots of translations for this. And actually, the... this is the last part I'm going to play. So I go to work. But this is where I talked about the thought form egregore shit. And I paraphrased him saying, you let this cat demon thing in. So the first problem was you let it in. And that's akin to accepting a thought. So thought is here. You can pretend that's a spirit that you can't see there. Some demon that you can't see there. Or just some floating thought. Maybe it's even from your own mind. Whatever you want to conceptualize, that's real to you. That's okay. But understand the concept. All I need you to understand, I don't care how you understand it, is... There's something there that sends that thought to you. Whether it's from your own mind or something outside, doesn't matter. But something comes in. That's you opening that door. This is what God tells Cain is his problem. He opened that door. He accepted that thought. He shouldn't have accepted that thought. Once he accepted that thought, it started, it started altering his reality. It started creating circumstances. And he went with it. He started accepting more thoughts. And then when the outcome happened from accepting those thoughts, because... When he let it in and he started playing with the idea of those thoughts, right? When you accept the thought that you're going to be broke, you probably have money in the bank, you probably just got paid or you're waiting for your payday to come, right? But then a month later, after accepting the idea that you're going to be broke, things get real bad and you're like, what the fuck? Why me? Well, no, you accepted those thoughts. That's what you wanted. It doesn't happen instantaneously all the time. It can and it does, but not always. This is what you did. So that's what I think this is happening. He lets it in. He accepts the thoughts. He starts fucking around with it. Starts having fun with the thoughts. Doesn't care. It doesn't really matter. And then, boom, something bad happens. And then he's like blaming God. And God's like, no, no, no. This is your doing. But you think about it the way you want. But this is, I just want to point out that this is how I thought of it immediately. And I was like, man, that's so cool. That's what my last episode was about. It was about the thought forms and shit like that. And that's exactly what this sounds like. But at the very least, it's like, no, you... And if you don't want to think about it in a thought form way, it's like, no, you invited evil in or you started flirting with evil. Maybe you're just attracted to it. I don't know. But it's not going to get you anywhere. So you want to keep doing these things that you're attracted to. That's fine. But it's not going to impress me. So you have to find some balance. You can do those things, but not in a way that's going to affect your outcome. And don't blame me whenever you do fucked up shit. But anyways, I'll let you hear from him. Make up your own mind. But after this, I'm going to be cutting off. So... Like I said, unless something else pops up that I really want to comment on because I really got to go. But I hope you have a great fucking day. This line is, and unto these, unto these shall be his desire. Yes. What God actually says is something like this. It's like, you know, things aren't going so well for you, but if you were behaving properly, they would. But instead, this is what you've done. Sin came to your door, and sin means to, you know, pull your arrow back and to miss the target. Sin came to your door. But he uses a metaphor, and the metaphor is something like, Sin came to your door like this sexually aroused cat, predator thing. And uh, you invited it in first. And then you let it have its way with you. It's like you entered into a creative 
he uses a sexual metaphor, he entered into a creative exchange with it and gave birth to something as a consequence. And that, what you gave birth to, that, that's your life. And, and you knew it. You're self-conscious after all. You knew you were doing this. And you conspired with this thing to produce the situation that you're in. Jung said something about this similar, about the Oedipal mother situation, which I, it was very politically incorrect what he said. Of course, every single thing he wrote was politically incorrect. So, which is how you could tell he was a thinker, by the way. <laughs> um, he talked about the unholy alliance between hyperdependent children and their mothers. And he said, well, it's actually, because Freud thought about it as a, as a maternal thing. I'm not putting Freud down. Because Freud mapped out the Oedipal situation brilliantly. I'm not putting Freud down. But, you know, Jung was taking the ideas and expanding them outward. And, you know, he said that there was an, actually an unholy alliance between a hyper-dependent child and, a, and, a, and an Oedipal over-dependent mother. And the alliance was, the mother would always offer... So maybe the kid is supposed to go off and do something that would require a little bit of courage and effort. And uh, the mother says, well, are, are you sure you're feeling well enough to do it? And then the child could say, yes. Or the child could say, no, and then, you know, be put in bed and babied and all of that. And, but the thing is, the child made the damn decision too. And you might think, well, that's pretty harsh, but just because children are little doesn't mean they're stupid. And you don't know children if you don't know how children know how to manipulate, because they are staggeringly good at that, because they're studying you nonstop, trying to figure out, A, what you're up to, and B, how they can get what they want in, in the way that they want it. And so they can play a manipulative game, no problem, especially if they're well-schooled in it. And so it's sort of like that. It's like maybe the mother is a little, too, a little timid and a little inclined to overprotect, and maybe the child is a little manipulative and a little willing to not take that courageous step out in the world and to regress into infantile dependency instead. And then you get a terrible dynamic building across time that is like a vicious circle, you know, or like a positive feedback loop. It just expands and expands and expands. Because sometimes in families you see a hyper-dependent child and a perfectly independent child and same mother. So obviously, same mother. I mean, mother's very complex and mother for child A and mother for child B are not the same mother, even if they happen to be the same human being. The literature is quite clear on that. But you get my point. But God's idea was not only are you not doing well because you're not doing well, but you're not doing well because you've actually really spent a lot of work figuring out how to not do well. This is like creative effort on your part. And if you read about truly malevolent people, you could start with the Columbine killers because they left some very interesting diaries behind. So I would recommend them. If you, There's plenty of serial killers you could read about and the people who've really gone out and done dark things. And I've read more than my fair share of that sort of thing and understand it quite well. Um, if you really want to have your countenance fall and be wroth, ten years of brooding on your own catastrophe, sort of alone, and letting your fantasies take shape, and <coughs> accepting the same thoughts over and over and over again. Instead of getting over something you did wrong, something you did bad, somehow hurt somebody, maybe somebody even died and you can't get over it. You sit there wondering what would have happened if you did something differently or accepting the same terrible thought over and over and over again or banishing away any hopeful thoughts. And then your fantasy takes over like he says. You start seeing how shittier your life gets. Start seeing how good your life could have been in the past. But instead of accepting that, you banish that away because, well, what's the point of thinking about something like that that can't happen anymore because you're already fucked up? Um, that's what I think it means. And egging them on and, and allowing them to flourish and, let's say, take possession of you because that's exactly the right way to think about it. That'll get you somewhere like this. And there are more people who are like that than you think and you're more like that than you think. Well, so Cain, he's obviously not very happy about 
this whole answer, obviously, because the last thing you want to hear if your life is turned into a catastrophe and you take God to task for creating a universe where that sort of thing was allowed is that it's your own damn fault and you should straighten up and fly right, so to speak, and you shouldn't be complaining about the nature of being. But that is the answer he gets. And so then what happens? Well, we have to infer that if Cain was angry before, that he's a lot more angry now. And, of course, that's exactly what the story reveals. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. I'm going to read you something else now. This is foreshadowing again. This is from the same chapter, by the way. Do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Jesus was led into the wilderness, according to the story, to be tempted by the devil, Matthew 4, 1, prior to his crucifixion. This is the story of Cain, restated abstractly. Cain is far from happy, as we have seen. He's working hard, or so he thinks, but God is not pleased. Meanwhile, Abel is dancing away in the daisies. His crops flourish, women love him. Worst of all, he's a pretty good guy. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to hate him. I used to joke when I, I used to teach at Harvard, and now and then my wife would have some of the undergraduates over. We used to joke afterwards, because some of them were, ver many of them were very remarkable kids, you know, like they... They were super smart, they were athletic, or they had some dramatic ability, or they were musicians, or they'd done some spectacular charitable work. Because you basically, to get accepted into Harvard, you had to be top of your damn school, and then you had to have at least two other outstanding things going for you, you know? And what was so annoying about most of these kids, this was our joke, was you really both liked them and respected them. It's like, we, we, my joke was, you'd think they would have had the good graces to be like dislikable sons of bitches at least with all the all those other great things going for them they had to add like respectability and likability to it as well so you thought well you know it really couldn't happen to a better person it's like good god well that's 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 able situation you know it's like and you know the funny thing too is that that's an ideal that's the ideal right because an ideal person let's say would be someone who you would want to be like and and someone who is operating in the world like you would want to operate and someone whom fortune was smiling on and someone who was making the right sacrifices. It's really what you would want to be. And so Cain kills that. Right, so it's a psychological story too. And you see this in the cynicism that people have about people who have done well in the world. They're always looking for some reason why they've done well. They must be crooked or they must be they must be conniving, or they must be arrogant, or they must be psychopathic, or and of course all of those things exist. But it's a very bad trick to play on yourself to make the proposition that the person in the world who re represents your own ideal is that ideal because of despicable reasons. Because what you do is train yourself that the ideal that you should pursue can only exist if it's motivated by despicable reasons. And then what? Not only is Abel, your brother, dead as your brother in the field in reality, but you've also slaughtered your own ideal. Well, then what the hell are you going to work for? Well, how are you going to live then? Well, bitterly and miserably, that's for sure. Bitterly, miserably, and hopelessly, that's how you're going to live. You know, and it's so rare that I see, especially publicly, that people honestly admit with sports figures they'll do it that's the that's one place where that seems to happen but it's so uncommon for expressions of admiration and gratitude to manifest themselves in any public communication of any sort newspapers tv youtube twitter it's almost always undermining and backbiting and criticism and very often directed to people who who have often done little else but bring good things into the world for other people. And that's part of why this is such a profound story. He's a pretty good guy. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to hate him. That's for sure. Cain broods on his misfortune like a vulture on an egg. 
He enters the desert wilderness of his own mind. He obsesses over his ill fortune and betrayal. He nourishes his resentment. He indulges in ever more elaborate fantasies of revenge. His arrogance grows to Luciferian proportions. I'm ill-used and oppressed, he thinks. This is a stupid, bloody planet. It can go to hell. And with that, he encounters Satan in the wilderness and falls prey to his temptations. And he does what he can in John Milton's unforgettable words to confound the race of mankind in the first root and mingle and involve earth with hell, done all to spite the great creator. He turns to evil to obtain what good forbade him, and he does it voluntarily, self-consciously, and with malice. Let him who has ears hear. So that's the first two human beings. The resentful, bitter failure taking an axe to the admirable success. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And He said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. (coughs) Now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. You know, if you want to understand that, which I would recommend. All right, well, I'm going to end it there. I was was hoping to get into the sevenfold part and all that, Um, so that you could hear it for yourself. Um, <coughs> I have to go to work, like I said. I'm not going to have time to put the links on, like I said I might. Um, I'm going to try to do with all at least, maybe on my break if I think of it. If not, at 11 o'clock when I get home, to put on the Kigon meditation slash hypnosis thing. I do every single night, almost a religious thing. <laughs> now, for the last, um, I don't know, I want to say two or three months now at least, I've been doing that, so something I think everybody should do. But, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. I know I said have a great fucking day, but I'm going to say it again. So, yeah, hope you have a great fucking day. I know.